Well, in 1916, they had had a Zionist movement that had been going on for a while in Europe. And this was like a moment for Jews to find prosperity and try to uh, protect themselves and, and make themselves more affluent. Uh, but they wanted to return to Palestine. You also mentioned Zionism and said that some of our young people in the Persian Gulf may not understand the role that Zionism is playing in this conflict. Could you explain what you mean by that? Unfortunately, they don't know what Zionism is, but Zionism is a political philosophy which has brought about the state of Israel, the so-called state of Israel. This, this political philosophy has nothing to do with religion. On the contrary, it seeks to confuse others and let them think that Zionism and Judaism is one and the same. I am a conscious African. I know properly my history. I know that Africa gave Judaism to the world. I know that the first Jews in the world were Africans. Not only do I know this, but I inform everyone who has doubts about it to read a book by Sigmund Freud entitled Moses and Monotheism as a beginning. Consequently, I know that Judaism and Zionism are not the same. Zionism had its first organizational expressions in 1897 in Bath, Switzerland, in Europe. Here was a man by the name of Theodor Herzl, H-E-R-Z-L. He was the founder of Zionism. He said that he was going to find the state that God promised the Jews. Listen to this very carefully. This man, Herzl, was an atheist. He had believed that there was no God. He said God did not exist. Now, how is it that the man who believes that God does not exist is going to find a state that God promised to his chosen people? I'm telling you, this man is Satan in disguise. Zionism is a satanic movement. It is devil. It is imperialism. It is racist. It has gone and taken the lands of the Palestinian people and through terrorism has driven them out. And through terrorism, it maintains its power. And the United States of America, with over six million homeless, sends to Israel billions and billions and billions of dollars everywhere to bomb Palestinian people while homeless people are here and unemployed are here. Zionism is going to raise this war and make the people in America become clear to what it is and become anti-Zionist and stop the aid to Israel and use the money to take care of the homeless in this The same people that have stripped us of our identity and labeled us as a, as a color have told us what it means to be black. The white man is enacting a story all over the world. Mm -hmm. we, we left our homes and flooded the world. We smothered culture. We smothered knowledge. We erased history and rewrote it our way. Myself, I'm 100, or my grandfather is 100% Ashkenazi Jewish, claiming to be Jewish. Ashkenazi Jewish is just a conspiracy. White men claiming to be of tribes of Israel when I'm Germanic, you know, I, yeah. I have no ties to Israel, no ties to Judaism, you know, except, except loosely written history that's been whitewashed over for centuries, mm. and, you know. It's, From the Renaissance. Oh yeah, right. Yeah, you just yeah. you you wipe everything yeah. clean. It's funny how yeah, exactly the Renaissance. It's this rebirth, but it's it's white rebirth. Mm. I think at the same exact time the Renaissance is happening, Columbus is sailing to America and committing mm. genocide. There's only one true ethnic Jew, the Mizrahi Jew, because they are Africans. And if you read the original Bible written in Phoenician Hebrew, they're not Jewish people. Are not. Europeans. The modern Jews in Israel are Russians from, or Khazars to be precise, from <laughs> Russia. I learned it from the same people that have stripped us of our identity and labeled us as a, as a color have told us what it means to be black. Most Egyptologists and anthropologists, archaeologists of the Eurocentric persuasion will say that uh, Egypt is in Africa. They had to concede that, but then they still draw the line by saying that uh, they weren't Africans like that. In other words, they weren't dark-skinned people. And of course, this is all part of the great deception. And the reality is that if they give up Egypt, ancient Egypt, ancient Kemet, if, if they give that up and say that that was a part of black Africa, then they will also have to give up Israel. And that's why they draw the line at Egypt, because if they give up Egypt, they've got to give up Israel. Now, we're going to go over here and I'm gonna show you where Israel sits on the African tectonic plate, which means that Israel is Northeast Africa. Now, when we look at this map, this is the, this is the Sinai, okay? This is the Red Sea. This is Egypt. This is the Sinai. This is Israel. All right, this is Saudi Arabia over here. 
Now, if you see this in Hebrew, it says Haluak Africani, the African plate. Here it is right here. Israel is sitting right here. Israel is sitting on the Haluaka Africani, which means that Israel is Northeast Africa. Uh, without question, we are in Northeast Africa. We are landlocked to Egypt, with the exception of the Suez Canal, which was a man-made uh, ditch, a boundary now uh, between, in fact, it's not even really a boundary anymore since uh, Egypt has reclaimed the Sinai Peninsula. Uh, but nevertheless, even those of us who are Pan-Africanists in our thinking and Afrocentric, we forget and we leave off that portion of Northeast Africa and, and, and don't want to claim anything beyond that. Europeans classified this area as a Middle East. You know, and then since this is the Middle East, the other question, where the Middle West? Where the Middle North and where the Middle South? They don't have no geographical terms like that. <laughs> The same people that have stripped us of our identity and labeled us as a, as a color have told us what it means to be black. You know, you know what you are? are you are an ancient Israelite. Ancient right? Israelite, yeah, that's what you are. I'm telling you, that's who you are. Sure, if you give me time, yeah. if you give me time, but, 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 all that he said, uh, no, I know, time, we don't have uh, so many years. I know, I know. Look, look at this. This is pages and pages of yes. notes, and I promise we'll give more yes. teaching. But here is my challenge to you. All right, I'm hearing some of your traditions. It's like the days of the Bible. Yes. Do you want to remain ancient Israelites, or you want to be Jews? Do you want to remain ancient Israelites? Or you want to be Jews? I'm hearing some of your traditions. It's like the days of the Bible. Yes. Do you want to remain ancient Israelites? Or you want to be Jews? That is the question I have for you. Thank you. I'll answer that question. Go, Go ahead. ahead. I will help you. After the demise of Solomon, we now have the northern and southern kingdom of Israel. Yes. So when we talk about Jews, Jews are Israelites, but all Israelites are not Jews. The ten tribes that got lost are not Jews. They were Israelites. Jews are Israelites, but all Israelites are not Jews. The ten tribes that got lost are not Jews. They were Israelites. Jews are Israelites, but all Israelites are not Jews. The ten tribes that got lost are not Jews. They were Israelites. So when we talk about Jews, Jews are Israelites, but all Israelites are not Jews. The ten tribes that got lost are not Jews. They were Israelites. Well, it's depending. So uh, well, well, majority cannot swallow the majority. We are here. We are the majority <laughs> down here. So you are minority, and we are older than you. The same people that have stripped us of our identity and labeled us as a, as a color have told us what it means to be black. Today, it is prohibited, and you can Google this, to do a DNA test in Israel. Totally forbidden. Wrong. It's illegal. It's a crime. You'll be jailed if you do a DNA test in Israel. Why? Because they know the truth will come out. You come from Poland, you come from Ukraine, you came from Europe, you came from everywhere else. And they were the original Middle Eastern Jews who lived together with the Muslims and the Christians for centuries. For centuries. So what happened to a lot of the Jews? The major problem of Israel is with the young generation of the Black community. Black's life matter starts there. I had last week a dinner, sit down dinner at my house with some of the people which are considered the leadership of the black community. Assalamu alaikum. In the 13th tribe, Arthur Kosler traces the origin of Eastern Europe's Jewish population that was largely decimated by the Nazi onslaught during the Second World War. Through extensive research, he discusses the history of a trading empire that was set up by a tribe known as the Khazars. 
The Khazar Empire was located between the expanding power blocks of Christianity and Islam, and the people were converted to Judaism by their king as a way of standing apart from both. The Khazarians and their wealth were dispersed through the countries of Eastern Europe after the collapse of the Khazar Empire. The Khazarians were not a Semitic people that they called themselves Jews after their conversion to Judaism is as absurd as the Chinese Muslims calling themselves Arabs is as absurd as the Chinese Muslims calling themselves Arabs is as Now I can't figure it out. If y'all are the chosen ones, shouldn't y'all be obeying better than me? I mean, I even try to keep the fourth commandment. Try to keep the Sabbath day holy. I've spent many of hours trying to figure out which is the right Sabbath day because we know that old Catholic church, something a little fishy about them, don't we? With that white Jesus. I mean, here's a white guy telling you black people that your Messiah is not a long-haired white European guy. Your Messiah is Hebrew, my darker-skinned brothers and sisters. When are you guys going to wake up and become kings and queens? And so in 1916, the British government, which was controlled by Freemasons, while the British with the Arab Egyptians began to invade the Sudan, the Italians began to invade Ethiopia, the French invade Morocco and Algeria, the Spanish invade Mauritania and, and what is now called Sahara, the French invade what is Senegal, Mali area, while the Portuguese invaded what is part of Guinea area, while the British invades again what is Nigeria and Ghana, and the German invades what is Gabon, Congo and Angola and Namibia, but the Portuguese controlled Angola, so the Germans had to run down to Namibia. In the course of all of this, when the fighting was finished and the bloody wars had been fought, the Germans was left with the short end of the stick. Notwithstanding, they had called the conference in the first place to cut Africa up between the Europeans. But now Kaiser finds himself cut out of the deal by the turn of the century to 1900s. And he said, look, unless you give me a better piece of the land, because they hadn't discovered uranium in Namibia yet, and he didn't realize the true value of the farmland in Tanzania to the economy of Europe yet. So stuck with Tanzania and, and Namibia, which is mostly a desert, the Germans hit the ceiling. And when the Germans couldn't get a better deal on the African mineral resources, Germany went to war to find those resources in Europe. Interference in Africa started with slavery. When slavery had lost its value, it graduated into colonization. And that is the context in which Berlin must be seen. When the European powers sat in Berlin and divided the continent of Africa into spheres of influence. When colonization had lost its luster through a combination of certain realities and agitation from the continent, we regained our independence. But as John Henry Clark, that great African-American said, we regained independence by mimicking European governance systems and he rightly says, no African country will ever succeed on the basis of those systems. After that, the neo-colonial project was instituted. And all of us will remember Kwame Nkrumah's book, Neo-Colonialism, The Last Stage of Imperialism. And he dare says, the most dangerous. We are now in a neo-colonial stage when the European powers are at their most diabolical, when the Americans are at their most diabolical. Imagine your neighbors through a youth theme party where one of the games was dividing your house and possessions up among the players. 
Oh, and you are not invited and it's not a game. Next day, they come round to take your stuff and make themselves comfy in your living room and garden and get your children to do the cleaning after a little beating for good measure. That's pretty much what happened at the Berlin Conference. Almost 140 years ago, Africa was divided into colonies carved out with a few pencils and rulers. These formalized the scramble for Africa. German Chancellor Otto von Bismarck was the brains behind this colonial tea party, inviting representatives of 13 European states, the United States of America and the Ottoman Empire to divvy up Africa, colonize its land, and steal its resources all at his residence in Berlin, a process that lasted over four months. Among the invitees were France, Germany, Great Britain, Portugal who were the major players. Of course, in this historic reshaping of Africa, there were some significant absentees. The Africans themselves who were not represented at any level during the conference. The Berlin Conference led to a period of heightened colonial activity by the European powers. Their supposed mission was to bring civilization to Africa in the form of Christianity and trade. That, for example, was what Belgium's king, Leopold, promised for his new possession, the Congo. In reality, what happened was the plundering of resources and genocide. Before the Berlin Conference, large swathes of Africa were still untainted by European settler colonialism. But soon after, all the states that make up present-day Africa had been parceled out among the colonial powers with the exception of Liberia and Ethiopia. Liberia had been formed by freed American slaves, while Ethiopia had managed to repel an Italian invasion. As such, they were the only two African nations to retain their sovereignty at the turn of the 20th century. The most influential European powers at the conference managed to secure the shares of the continent they wanted. To put all this in perspective, take a look at the map of Africa in 1880 and then take a look at what it had become by 1913. Great Britain affirmed its control over territories in the north, east and south of the continent. As well as Nigeria and Ghana in the west, France exercised control over most of West Africa including major parts of the Sahara Desert. Mozambique and Angola became a part of the Portuguese colonies, meanwhile Namibia and Tanzania came under German control. The way the continent was rejigged arguably set it up for later failures. The new geography may have settled the overlapping interest of European colonizers, but it did not account for ethnic grouping in Africa itself. New borders were drawn through the territories of every tenth ethnic group. Internal conflicts were also in many cases made possible through these new borders. For example, in pre-colonial Rwanda, the Hutu and Tutsi coexisted peacefully. It was colonial rule that laid the foundations down for the division that pitted these two ethnic groups against each other. That was at the heart of the 1994 genocide. Some historians call the Berlin Conference a crime against humanity. Some also pointed out that African leaders should have rejected these borders in the post-colonial era. One thing is certain, what happened in Berlin led to immeasurable pain and suffering. For many Africans, Europe's wealth and prosperity is built on the back of this inflicted misery. And so perhaps it's high time the ex-colonists held another Berlin conference to decide how much they should each pay in reparations. I hope the Jewish community would help bankroll World War I. In exchange for their support, uh, the British government, with solidarity with the newly established Zionist movement, um, had allowed Jews in Europe to flourish and they felt Jews could prevail in World War I if they could get the U.S. involved into providing greater relief for the war um, for the physicality aspect. So William Balfour, former Foreign Minister of Britain by way of the British MP David Lloyd, um, created the Balfour Accords. And according to that, the Balfour Accords was made in association with Walter Rothschild. Remember, I mentioned the Rothschilds earlier. And he was the unofficial leader of Britain's Zionist movement. We are proud of the role that we played in the creation of the State of Israel, and we will certainly mark the centenary with pride. This was what Theresa May had to say about the 100-year anniversary of the Belfort Declaration. But what exactly happened on November 2nd, 1917? And what was the Belfort Declaration all about? These 68 words were a historic promise given to the early Zionist movement by the British government for the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. 
Sir Arthur Balfour, then Foreign Secretary of Britain, wrote in a public letter to a famous British Zionist, Lord Walter Rothschild, which read, His Majesty's government views with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object. It being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. This was just what the Zionists were looking for. As outlined in the first Zionist Congress during its meeting in Basel, Switzerland in 1897, Zionism seeks to establish a home for the Jewish people in Palestine secured under public law. Earlier, Theodor Herzl, their founder, had failed to realize this purpose when he couldn't get support from the Ottomans or any other European ruler. But this declaration basically laid out the foundation for the State of Israel. And since the second part of the agreement, you know, where it talks about protecting the civil and religious rights for non-Jewish communities in Palestine was never implemented, it resulted in a great injustice towards the Palestinian people as thousands of them lost their homeland with the creation of this new Jewish state, and the ones who remained are being treated like second-class citizens. I think the late British author and journalist Arthur Coester summed it up best when he said, one nation solemnly promised to another nation the country of a third. What were they thinking? Well, you see, Great Britain was in the midst of World War I, and one of its biggest foes was the Ottoman Empire. So, they employed the tried and tested strategy of divide and conquer. They were giving the Arabs the promise of complete and final liberation in return for rebellion against the Ottoman rulers. The crown had decided Palestine's for the Jews, thus ensuring a perpetually divided Middle East. And 31 years after the Balfour Declaration, the State of Israel was founded. But it's not 100% certain that this was the initial goal of the British government the results have brought devastating consequences to the Middle East. It paved the way for the longest military occupation in recent history and destabilized an entire region. So should the UK government be proud of this landmark letter? Or should they come to terms with the reality of what it's done? So, as I said, the Rothschild family created the modern banking system as we know it today. and the British community and their Freemasons needed the money of the Jewish community. There's also claims that the Rothschild family helped finance World War II, and there's evidence of Jewish figures assisting in the capture of Jews during World War II, essentially saying World War II was a ruse to attempt to reestablish the state of Israel. They allowed all these atrocities to happen. That's right. You're not Hitler. You're not a Nazi. You don't deserve to be called that and demonized. Well, I I see I I see good things about Hitler also. The Jew I love everyone. I'm done with the classifications. Every human being has something of value that they brought to the table, especially Hitler. Man schaue sich im Lager unserer Feinde um. Wohin man blickt, Juden über Juden. Juden hinter Hundewelt als ein Gerntrag. Juden hinter Zirkel als eine Einbläser. Juden als Hetze und Einpfeife in der gesamten englisch-amerikanisch-sowjetischen Presse. Juden in den dunklen Winkeln des Kreml als die wirklichen Träger des Bolschewismus. 
Der internationale Jude ist der Gipfel, der die feindliche Koalition zusammenhält, der schlägt durch seine weltumfassenden Beziehungen die Brücken zwischen Moskau, London und Washington. Wir stehen hier dem gefährlichsten Feind der Welt gegenüber. Von ihm geht der Krieg aus, er führt ihn aus dem Hintergrund an, aber er ist nicht unüberwindlich. Wir haben gegen diese terroristische jüdische Welteroberung, die die im Inneren unseres Reiches 14 Jahre lang unter den denkbar ungünstigsten Umständen gekämpft. Wie wir ihn einmal im Inneren zu Fall gebracht haben, so werden wir seine Macht, die uns nun von außen bedroht. The UN is formed after World War II. Britain had control over Palestine after the Ottoman Empire um, had lost during World War I. And Britain controlled that territory. And they also had influence in Iran and multiple cultures, you know, throughout Arabia. And through Britain and several other countries, France as well, um, they decided to break up all the tribes of the Middle East and create these borders, which you call Syria, Libya, um, you will call Iraq, uh, Jordan. They decided to break them all up because it's easier to control a society divided. The same with the planet. It's easy to create division because if you create division, people will police each other. It's how slave plantations with Africans was maintained for 400 years. So the UN helped assist in that matter um, and what was interesting at the end of World War II was that they made it clear that no one wanted to take in the Jewish community globally. But there also, there's also an implication that was by design so that you could f force them to go back into Palestine. Um, but the U.S. definitely accepted Nazis. And if you don't believe me, watch the film Oppenheimer, which just came out in theaters not too long ago. But yeah, um, so if the Jewish community annexed part of Germany, you know, or Ashkenazis did so, that would have been more understandable at that time. But that was not a part of the uh, goal of Walter Rothschild as the leader of the Zionist movement. Imagine if Israel was part of East Africa instead of Palestine. Although it may seem far-fetched, the idea was in fact seriously considered and almost came into effect in the early 1900s. Zionist leader Theodor Herzl turned to the UK who offered to resettle Jews in Britain's colony in East Africa. It was known as the Uganda Scheme. Herzl brought the matter before the 6th Zionist Congress in Switzerland in 1903. It passed the first hurdle with a majority vote. However, plans fell through at the 7th Zionist Congress after experts who visited Uganda found it unsuitable for Jewish settlement. This is the point where we look at the other proposals for a Jewish state made throughout history and answer the question, what if Israel was somewhere else? Like I mentioned, there were at least eight proposals for other creations of a Jewish state. Some more serious than others, some more viable than others, and some taking into concern the well-being of the Jewish people while others attempted to do the opposite. Before going into each one, let's list them. First, the Ararat city in the United States, then British Uganda, British Guiana, the Jewish Autonomous Oblast in the Soviet Union, now Russia, the Fuku Plan in Japan, the Madagascar Plan, Port Davy in Australia, and the Jewish self-governing territory within Italian East Africa. Native locations, why were they proposed and why didn't they happen? Starting with Ararat City and the US. In 1820, a precursor idea to the creation of Israel took place. A man called Manuel Noah tried to found a Jewish homeland at Grand Island in the Niagara River to be called Ararat, after Mount Ararat, the biblical resting place of Noah's Ark. He built a monument there that read Ararat, a city of refuge for the Jews. However, this was more the project of a single individual and the idea didn't attract many followers, so he gave up and started to advocate for the creation of a Jewish state in the land of Palestine, then a part of the Ottoman Empire. Next, we have British Uganda. This project was known as the Uganda Scheme, a proposal presented in 1903 by Theodore Herzl to create a Jewish homeland in a portion of British East Africa. He presented it as a temporary refuge for Jews to escape 
rising persecution of Jewish people in Europe, something that had been a reality from time to time in the continent throughout history. Author Richard Zimler wrote a very interesting article a while back called Identified as the Enemy, or Why There Are So Few Jews in Portugal. Portugal is one example of how Jewish people were driven out by various rulers. At a time when some European countries were going back to this, the Uganda scheme presented a refuge idea. But when it was presented, other people who advocated for the creation of a Jewish state didn't agree with the location. Some others pitched the idea of it instead happening in Portuguese Angola, a thought that had existed since 1886, proposed by some as a historical reparation for their expulsion in the 15th century in connection to the article that I just mentioned, with Mozambique also being an alternative but neither were followed. As the British seemed committed to Uganda, Joseph Chamberlain even stated, if Dr. Herzl were at all inclined to transfer his efforts to East Africa, there would be no difficulty in finding land suitable for Jewish settlers. They ended up agreeing to establish it and even sent a delegation to prepare for the settling, but then realized the natives were against it. And apparently there were too many lines making it dangerous. This sounds ridiculous, but it's actually listed as the main reason for the failure. The British Empire had one more attempt at establishing a Jewish state before moving forward with the Palestine option, Guyana. In 1939, a plan to resettle a modest number of Jewish refugees in British Guiana existed, but was put on hold due to the start of World War II. The British government decided that the problem is, at present, too problematic to admit of the adoption of a definite policy and must be left for the decision of some future government in years to come. The reason why the first Uganda scheme was thought of was because of a persecution of Jewish people that was taking place in Russia. The Russian Empire was inciting violent riots called pogroms against various communities, namely the Jewish ones. This brings us to another proposed creation of a Jewish state further ahead in history, when the Russian Empire was no more and the Soviet Union now existed. The Jewish Autonomous Oblast was created in the 1930s as a homeland for working Jews. According to Joseph Stalin's national policy, each each of the national groups that formed the Soviet Union would receive a territory in which to pursue their cultural autonomy in a socialist framework, something that didn't effectively happen, and this solution was more of an attempt to contain whatever groups they chose. Another important goal of the project was to increase settlement in the remote Soviet Far East. In 1928, there was virtually no settlement in the area, while Jews had deep roots in the western half of Russia and Ukraine. In fact, there had initially been proposals to create a Jewish Soviet Republic in in Crimea, but this was then rejected. In the Eastern Oblast, Jewish leaders were eventually arrested and executed by the Soviet state. Shortly after it, World War II brought the whole idea to a halt. After the Soviet Union was dissolved, most Jews in Russia moved to Germany or then Israel itself. The Autonomous Oblast still exists today within the Russian Federation with the same name, but there are very, very few Jewish people that actually live there. One other plan that is said to have existed, despite there being very little evidence pointing towards it, is the Fugu Plan in Japan. Marvin Tokayer and Mary Swartz published a book called The Fugu Plan in 1979. In this partly fictionalized book, they refer to memoranda written in 1930s Imperial Japan proposing settling Jewish refugees escaping persecution in Europe. They supposedly proposed that a large number of Jewish people should be encouraged to settle in Manchukuo or Japan-occupied Shanghai, taking advantage of the supposed economic prowess of the Jewish people, as well as gaining favor with the United States. The signing of the Tripartite Pact in 1941 and other events prevented its full implementation, according to these authors. But some investigators have stated that the memoranda used as a source was taken out of context, and there was never really any plan of this sort. One plan that did, sadly, exist was the Madagascar Plan. This was a plan created by the German Third Reich to forcibly relocate Jewish people from Europe into the African island of Madagascar. This happened in 1940 after the war and great persecution of Jewish communities had already begun. As victory in France was imminent, they believed that they would take control of all French colonies, including Madagascar. Their memorandum called for the resettlement of a million Jews per year for four years, with the island governed as a police state under the SS. The plan was not viable, thankfully, when proposed due to the British naval blockade. It was also not a serious plan for relocation and seeked only to harm and ultimately destroy 
these people. But Germany wasn't the only Axis power that had a proposal of the sort. Also in colonial Africa, there was a proposal for a Jewish self-governing territory within Italian East Africa. The Italian dictator's government in the early 20th century offered to resolve what they called the Jewish problem in Europe by resettling these people into a self-governing territory in their colonial possession. There was apparently a small Jewish community living there already in what is today Ethiopia. The proposed self-governing territory was to be within the Italian Empire Empire and would likely mean harsh and awful living conditions, thankfully Mussolini's plan was also never implemented. And finally, one other short-lived attempt was Port Davy in Australia. The explanation for this one is as short as its existence. In around 1940, with the support of the then Premier of Tasmania, Robert Cosgrove, a man called Critchley Parker proposed the creation of a Jewish settlement at Port Davy in southwest Tasmania, Australia. He went as far as surveying the area, but then he died in 1942, and this idea died along with him. Hey guys, if you want to watch more clips, click here. And if you want to watch the full podcast, click right here.